we have Lordship S, uh, Mr. B. N. Sri Krishna, uh, a retired judge of the Supreme Court of India with us as well. Uh, this is a very interesting session. The, the session is titled Ethics and Morality in Public Life. Uh, it, you know, it's best exemplified by his career. I'm going to call Mr. Mysore Prasanna to uh, make the introductions as well. How privileged I am here to, to stand here before you and in the august company of two very eminent persons. The IRIX annual awards, the jury award for the impact person of the year, Justice Santosh Hegde. I went to his house to request him to find time to commute to Bombay and be able to address all of us in morality and ethics in public life, and also personally receive this award and enhance the image prestige of the award itself. This is a unique event when the award is getting rewarded, because the person who is receiving the award actually enhances the quality and the meaning of this award. And all of you know, Justice Santosh Hegde has, has had an illustrious career as a judge. He was Advocate General of Karnataka, then Additional Solicitor General, and then Solicitor General. And it was one person who was invited to become a Supreme Court judge directly. As you all know, way back in the emergency when the supersession of judges happened, three judges resigned protesting against that policy. Justice Shalit, Justice Grover, and Justice Hagde, the illustrious father of the illustrious son. And it is extremely um, interesting to know that Justice Santosh Hagde was never aspiring to become the judge of a Supreme Court. In fact, he passed on many offers to become the judge of the Karnataka High Court. But when he was offered to become a judge of the Supreme Court directly, he wasn't too sure, but apparently by the time his father had passed away and the family, particularly the wife, and mother, they actually said it would really be an honor to accept this position because your father will be smiling from the heavens to know that his son has carried on the tradition of being the torchbearer of justice. When I was talking to Justice Hegde, he actually told me that he would have quietly faded into the oblivion as a no it's inconsequential, one of the retired judges. But in his own words, his donning the role of Lokayukta propelled him into a different league and the kind of uh, uh, history that he has had as a Lokayukta is something that you need to listen from him. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a great honor. Put your hands together for Justice Santosh Hegde. May I request Justice B. N. Sri Krishna to please come up and uh, share his experience of being a colleague of Justice Santosh Hegde. Mr. Justice Hegde, normally called by me as Santosh. <coughs> and dear friends, I am under a great disadvantage of not being even enough time to talk about my brother judge here. Because he has a flight to catch, he is in a hurry. I try to compress my thoughts into as little number of words, as few number of words as possible. <laughs> I had the privilege of appearing before the illustrious father long, long ago when I was still a callow young junior. Subsequently, I had seen Santosh here as an assist, uh, as an ASG in the Supreme Court. I had no connection with him as a attorney, uh, advocate general in Karnataka, but as ASG, I had seen him in the Supreme Court. 
He was quite a senior man, and I was quite a junior, walking around in the corridors. Then, as luck would have it, he became a colleague, rather, I became a colleague of his in the Supreme Court, and we had the privilege of sharing some time on the bench and off the bench and in the cozy corner where we used to have our private coffee discussions. That he is an upstanding person of unimpeachable character. All of you know there is nothing else that can be said. We have read, we have seen on the TV, the way, the zeal with which he went after people who, of doubtful integrity, the way in which he went after people who made money by wrong means and made a report to the government, which, like, alas, like all other good reports, gets uh, no action whatsoever from the governments for obvious reasons. That, despite this kind of a frustrating experience, he continued in bulldog fashion is a tribute to him that he is one of those persons who is interested in doing his job irrespective of the consequences, irrespective of what results it pro provides for him. But ultimately, good is always recognized irrespective of what people may say. I can tell you a very interesting anecdote. All of you must have heard of the great Kalidasa, who was the outstanding poet of this country. It appears that there was an assembly of very learned persons, a jury like your IDEX, thinking how to find out the best persons who are literatures. So they said, this, so the Sanskrit couplet goes, Pura kavinam ganana prasange kanishthika dhishtita kalidasaha. This is called Kanishthika in Sanskrit. So the first said, who is the best man? Kalidasa. Adhyapi tattulya kavera bhava anamika sartha babhuva. This is called Anamika in Sanskrit. Anamika means that which has no name. So they couldn't find a second name at all. So that is why this finger is always called Anamika. So some, something like that I would say, if we were to be called today, as to the best loka yukta that this country has produced, undoubtedly all of us will say, yes, Mr. Justice Santosh Hegde. Thereafter, <laughs> nobody. We have had, in Karnataka there has been a series of vacuums. Everybody has had some problem or the other and retired, uh, recused, 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 resigned. Therefore, this is the tribute that the only person who was found fit to act as a loka yukta who had the courage enough to teach the government what needs to be done, face the chief minister in the eye and tell him that you better throw the la proper line of rectitude, otherwise you'll also go behind the bars. And he was also responsible for some of the fellows who have really gone behind the bars. To such a person that there should be recognition by a body like this of lawyers is therefore not very unusual, not very surprising. In fact, it should be a lobby of lawyers to say, let's go and not clap at all politicians and not keep on chasing politicians, but let's chase honest men so that they are in our midst, they teach us what is ethics, not only in public life, but also in private life. Public life, and it can't be, it can't be that public, I'm surprised that the topic that you have chosen, why is it only in public life that you talk of ethics? You should be have in your private life also ethics also. Therefore, we can't find another paradigm of this kind of a subject. And despite the fact that I know him for a number of years, I have been his colleague and he has been a good friend, we have also had the privilege of uh, 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 sitting on arbitration panels. I say, my salute to you, Justice Hegde, for all the human service that you have rendered to the country, uh, if a good cricketer can get Padma, what did he get? Bharat Ratna. I don't see why Bharat Ratna should not be given to him. May, let's all hope that he gets the Bharat Ratna one of these days. Thank you very much. Justice Hegde will address the gathering, valid address of this function. He will speak about morality in ethics in public life, 
And uh, may I request you to put your hands together and welcome Justice Santosh Hegde. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Sri Krishna. I will explain to you my experience as Karnataka Lokayakta, which is an ombudsman's institution. I think uh, that will speak about the morality and public life, which is the topic this evening. I spent five years in the Karnataka Lokayakta, which is an ombudsman institution. And in that five years, many things changed in me. starting from the fact that I'm not wearing a suit today because I found in the beginning when I was wearing suit and when I went to the office where I had to interact with large number of poor people with torn shirts, torn dhotis, no slippers, such like people, I couldn't have an eye contact with them because they looked at me from a different view altogether. Then with friends I discussed why should this be so and all. And we all decided, let me change my attire and see how it works. I went with open shirt collar and started meeting people, insisting they should first and interact with me sitting and not standing. There was a lot of change I saw. People started talking to me, explaining their problems. And I could sort of help them out of their problems. Karnataka Lokayakta is an institution which has two powers. One to fight against corruption through the Karnataka Lokayakta police. The other is grievance redressal, redressing the grievances of the people arising from an institution created under the Constitution of India called the government. I saw so much of suffering of the people, arrogance of power, corruption, which really, really, if I explain it to you, it will be a, a very difficult thing for you all to uh, understand and digest it because you would not have personally seen this. As a matter of fact, I thought after coming to the Karnataka Lokayakta, I was a frog in the well earlier, even if being a judge of the Supreme Court or other posts that I have held. I hope that is the same situation in other states also, but since I have no personal knowledge, I'm confining it to uh, my knowledge of the thing. I have come to the conclusion today that we live in a society which respects money and power only. It has no respect for honesty, hard work. In that background, if you see, my brother Sri Krishna spoke about values in those days. I have also seen values in 1950s and 60s and today I feel that most of the values the society should follow, people should follow are disappearing from the realities of life. When I retired, I was thinking what shall I do after retirement? Just then Anna Hazare's movement against corruption started. So I joined them. 18 months I was with them. I was participating in the protest. One day, one of my colleagues from the bench telephoned to me. He saw me sitting in a protest in a Maidan. He telephoned to me and told me, Santosh, what are you doing? You're spoiling the reputation of judges. Sitting in a Maidan, never heard of it. I didn't know why I was doing that. 18 months went by. Then the Anna Hazaris team broke up. I came out of it because a part of it became political. And now I go around to youth organizations and colleges interacting with the youth and students about the lack of values in the society and the problems that we have to face because of that. I find two of the most important human values are missing in a large number of people, the contentment in life and humanism. If you don't have contentment in life, I think you get a disease called greed, which has no meaning whatsoever, I mean, no, no treatment whatsoever. 
you are not content with any amount of money you make, any amount of property you acquire. If your aim is a crore rupees, you acquire crore rupees, you don't enjoy that crore rupees, you want multiple crores of rupees. You'll be never ever happy at all. Coming to humanism, many of us think we are born human beings. I don't think so. I think we want a species called homo sapiens. And in our journey of life, if we acquire humanism, exhibit it, then die as a human being, according to me. There is no greater glory than that. Let me give, it to you, give you some examples of what I saw with the thing. In 2008, a handicapped tailor with his wife and a six-month-old child came to my office. I asked him, what's the problem? He said, this child doesn't have a rectum. It eats through the mouth, defecates through the mouth. The local doctor has suggested to take this child to a better hospital where a pediatric surgeon could help the child. They took the child to a government medical college hospital where the pediatric surgeon examined the child and said, yes, I will do this, but it will cost you so much money. Money is not money, money is bribe. Husband and wife gave every bit of money they had, they put it on the table, and the doctor counts it and says, for this money, I'll make a hole near the rib cage so that the fecal matters could go out. Whatever example I'm giving it to you, it has appeared in the newspaper, it's in the uh, documents of the Karnataka Lokayakta. Not being satisfied, they brought the child to the Lokayakta. We, of course, sent the child to a private hospital because we had some contact with them. They didn't charge anything. And the parents' expenses for a month, the Lokayakta officers contributed and looked after that. What I'm trying to explain it to you is, look at this person. God gave him, he wanted to be educated. God gave him that boon. He wanted to be a doctor. God gave him that boon. He wanted to be a pediatric surgeon. God gave that boon. He finishes that. He goes to a government hospital where... In Karnataka, at least, it's a hospital meant for the poorest, the poorest only. It's jocularly said, patients who go to a government hospital in the state of Karnataka vertically, they come out horizontally. That is the situation prevailing. I don't know how it is in Maharashtra. This is one evidence of one piece of uh, uh, thing uh, which explains the lack of morality, lack of ethics in the profession. This doctor was not expected to do, do anything beyond the call of duty for which he was paid handsomely. And it is only his duty to do that. No. He didn't because he was suffering from a disease called greed. I'll give another example. In 2011, a person comes to Lokayakta to give a complaint. In Karnataka, there is a scheme called Bhagya Lakshmi. Under that scheme, a girl child born to a poor parent was entitled for some monetary benefits up to a certain age. He came and complained that he is from a poor this thing, a family. He has got a girl child born recently. The social welfare department is not giving the benefit on the Bhagya Lakshmi scheme. We sent an officer to his village to find out whether he was a poor person coming under the category of below poverty line. The officer went and examined and came back and told us that this lady, his wife, pregnant lady, walked with a colleague of hers for seven kilometers from a village to the government hospital. The staff knew her condition, but still wanted money. They said, money first, bed next. So she sends the accompanying person to uh, her village to get some money. Meantime, the staff said, don't sit here, sit outside. She walks across, it's in a bus stop. Before the money could come, she delivers a child in the bus stop in front of the government hospital. What do you think of the public servants in the thing? Let me just give an example of the growth of greed in this country. 50s, there was a scam called a Jeep scam. The money lost to this country was 52 lakhs in purchasing Jeep vehicles for the Indian soldiers. Thereafter, every year, one scam or two scam came out, but then all scams don't come to the public domain. Mundra scam of LIC, Dalmia scam of Bharat Bank, Nagarwala scam of Central Bank. Every time the scam came, number of zeros in that value started increasing. In 80s, 86, we had a big scam called Bofus. Money lost to this country was 64 crores of rupees. 
In 50s, it was 52 lakhs. In 80s, it was 64 crores. 2010, two scams. Commonwealth Games, 70,000 crores were lost to the country. Same year, 2G, 1.75 lakh crores was lost. This is not my figure. This is a figure given the CAG to the government of India. 2012 Colgate, 1 lakh 86,000 crores. How can there be a development with so much of money being siphoned off? Let me compare it to the budget of state of Karnataka for the year 2016-2017 for five and six and a half crores of people with 365 days. One crore, 62 lakhs. Whereas in one scam, you take a 1.75 lakhs of crores, I mean crores. This is the greed that is prevailing in our nation today. In 2010, I saw a photograph in a local vernacular newspaper, which depicted a lady sitting in the ground in somewhere in North Karnataka, taking the soil with a bare finger, the top soil with a bare finger, and the uh, article below the photograph said she has walked five kilometers in search of one pot of water. And if she gets one pot of water, she's happy because five members of the family have something to sit and something to cook. Forget washing and bathing. This, is a, this was a fate. I mean, this is a fate today also in a developed state like Karnataka. Right now we are going through a drought. The very same year in 2010, the CAG reported to the government of India that out of lakhs and lakhs of crores given by the government of India to every state government for supplying drinking water, 51,000 crores was unaccounted for. We take away money in supplying water, drinking water also. Look at our humanism. In 85, then the Prime Minister of India, late Rajiv Gandhi said, out of every rupee the government of India gives, to the ben poor, poor, for the benefit of the poor, only 15 paise reaches the beneficiary. 85. We are in 2016. How much money out of 10 rupees would reach the poor? Ladies and gentlemen, we are in that society today. We have to change that society. People like me can't do it because we are responsible for the situation that is prevailing today. You will have to do that, not for my sake, for your sake and the, for the sake of your children. No economy can survive if the zeros in this um, uh, scams keep going up. Every walk of life, under the Constitution of India, three pillars are created. The legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. For, from 1946 to 1949, an institution equivalent to the present parliament function, there was no problem there, no galata, no walking out, nothing. They gave us a wonderful constitution. The success of what's happening? In 2007, a magazine called Election Watch made a professional audit of the persons and the members of the Lok Sabha. And out of 540 Lok Sabha members in five years, those who spoke at least once in five years were only 174. And what, look at their behavior. In 2012, when Andhra was being divided, the, the bill was being uh, discussed in the Lok Sabha. It was being telecast. There was maramari going on. People were all in the well of the house. One member even used pepper spray. The speaker said, bill passed. Take the latest recent uh, winter session in the parliament. Ten days the Lok Sabha function. Not one item in the agenda was taken up. And Times of India says one day's cost for the functioning of the Lok Sabha is 10 crores, crores of rupees for one day. For 10 days it's 100 crores of rupees. This is what is happening in the legislature. Let us take the executive, the second pillar of the constitution. When the creation of executive was being discussed in the Constituent Assembly, many members said, they are the future administrators of this country. We should choose the best of the available people. Let politics not enter into it. Let politicians have no say in the selection of these people. So they created the Union Public Service Commission, State Public Service Commissions. What's happened there? Recently in Karnataka, 
A CID report is given, um, given to the government of Karnataka saying for every post so much money is I, um, uh, demanded. Now when they take money and become officers, will they keep quiet? They have to recover that money. Every scam that has come out in this country, in the public domain, there is the hand of one or more bureaucrats in that. Let's take the judiciary. I was also part of it for nearly 44 years in one form or other. How much time does it take to dispose of a case? 14 years in the first year? The first appellate court? The second appellate court? The high court or the supreme court? It's jokingly said if husband and wife fight between in the age of 25 and 30 and want a restitution of conjugal rights case to be filed, by the time they get the final decree, husband will be 80 years old, the wife will be 75 years old. This is the position in which we are. There was a time when people used to say, if legislature fails, the executive fails, the judiciary will protect us. Well, this is the three pillars of the Constitution, but the greed is not confined only to these pillars of the Constitution. In every walk of life, for example, take the media. Three or four years back, you must have heard the name of Mira Radia, the paid news concept. You take money and prepare a news item, which we all, all have to swallow it. Where is their honesty? Very often when I go and interact with the students, they ask me a question, sir, in the government of Karnataka, which department is honest, sir? I have no answer to give it, so I quote Gautam Buddha. He told the child, my mother who lost a child, to revive the child, please go to your house and bring some mustard where there has been no death. She couldn't find one. So is the case with me. I couldn't find one uh, in a, an honest department in the government of Karnataka. If this system continues, if our greed continues, if our in humanism, lack of humanism continues, please guess for yourself what has happened. I'll give an example of lack of humanism. In 2011, a, a marshal telephoned to me from Hyderabad. He said, Mr. Hegde, I never knew him. He telephoned to me, Mr. Hegde, three days back, my brother's 18-year-old daughter is killed in an accident in Bangalore. It's three days. We have kept an ambulance outside to bring the body to Hyderabad. The post-mortem is not done. Police say we won't hand over the body to the, uh, whoever is the person. Please help us. There are members in the family who have not sipped a bit of water in the last three days. Even the last flight is not done. I said, okay, I'll call you in a couple of hours. I went to that hospital, met the superintendent. He said, sir, it's impossible. I have deputed two qualified doctors uh, to do the post-mortem. Let's summon them and see what's happened. One of them came to know that the Lokayakta sitting there is guilty conscious, uh, made him put, uh, leave and go away. The other doctor comes. Look at this dialogue, which is good enough for any movie, according to me. As he enters, he says, what's the hurry? The body is not putrefying. It's in a fusa. Am I to treat living patients first? Or prefer it oh, to uh, examine a dead body? The superintendent asked him, who permitted you to go and uh, treat a patient in the main building? Oh, one person came and he said his relative uh, is not being properly treated. He wanted me to uh, um, treat him. So I went there to treat him for three days. So I asked him a question, doctor, did you know that person or the patient before? No, 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 he came first time. The uh, post-mortem room is about 50 meters away from the main building. Main building has about 50 doctors qualified in various uh, fields. Look at the bluff he comes out with then. Now. So I told him, I'm sitting here until you finish the post-mortem and hand over the body to the hearse. I won't go. Then see what the consequences are. He did it. But look at his humanism. For contra, let me give one example of Karnataka recently what happened about a month and a half back. One person by name Harish was run over by a vehicle. The front tire was punctured. He was running in the wheels. He ran over, the truck ran over him and the body was divided into two parts. But he's still alive. He was begging for water. Nobody gave him. They were photographing, videographing, everything was done, but nobody was going to give a little water. When the ambulance came, they picked up the bodies and put in the ambulance. Then he was still alive, and he was telling the ambulance attendant, please tell the doctor to donate my eyes. That is height of humanism, ladies and gentlemen. 
Even a bit of it is lacking in many a people I have seen. Ladies and gentlemen, I am thankful to IDEX for giving me this opportunity of being with you, and I thank you and the SSAs for that. I thank you all once again, and a very good evening to you all. honor and privilege to confer on Justice Hegde, Impact Person of the Year, and may I request Justice B. N. Sri Krishna to please do the honors. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Justice Santosh Hegde has to catch a flight to Mangalore. He has got uh, commitments tomorrow, and it's very nice of him that he took time out and just made a day visit here to be with us, address us, and uh, receive the award. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here. And uh, Justice Hegde will now take leave. And once again, thank you very much, sir. Thank you.